All right, so this is actually one of my favorite uh, topics to talk about um, because it has a lot of really cool astronomy and physics. But I want to start by asking, just by a show of hands, I should have asked this before, how many people are into science? Okay, good. And what about math? Uh-oh, you, you got to watch out for those people, the math people. Something wrong with them. No, I like math as well. But I want to start, see how you guys are on this date. Uh, who knows what took place April 11th, 1970 at 2.13 p.m. Eastern Standard Time? Anybody know? Don't say it was my birthday. <laughs> I was born in 83, believe it or not, despite my hair. Was that a UFO that was sighted over Phoenix, Arizona? No. There was something in the air. There's something in the sky, though. Apollo. Apollo, which one? 13. You saw the movie. Who saw the movie? Yeah, that was the Apollo 13 mission. So at 2.13 p.m., April 11th, 1970, Apollo 13 launched from Kennedy Space Center. This was the third scheduled mission to the moon. Now, unfortunately, Apollo 13 would never actually land on the moon. Initially, everything was going to plan on this magnificently designed spacecraft. However, 55 hours and 54 minutes into the mission, traveling at 3,200 kilometers per hour. That's 2,000 miles per hour for our American friends. That's 900 meters per second. That's as fast as a speeding bullet, okay? The crew hears and they feel a loud explosion. And then you get Captain Jack Swigert's famous words, which are, Houston, we have a problem. And it was a huge problem. They are now 370,000 kilometers from the Earth, traveling in the wrong direction, and they were experiencing their worst nightmare. In fact, they couldn't even have trained for this. What had happened was Auction Tank 2 had exploded. In fact, they looked out the window and they could see Auction leaking into space. That's a problem. They looked at their fuel cells. Two of the three are dead, and the third is rapidly depleting. The crew has a new mission, and that is to bring the astronauts home safely. And that they did. Despite limited water, they lived off 175 milliliters a day. Loss of cabin heat, some of them suffered from hypothermia. Despite limited power, they actually had to make a special carbon monoxide removal system they survived and returned home safely on April 17th, just six days after they left. In fact, the mission was called a successful failure. A successful failure. Why am I telling you all this? Well, just as the Apollo 13 crew survived against all odds in the lethal conditions of space, we too survive against all odds on this tiny planet that we call Earth. Now, the conditions of the Apollo 13 spacecraft, they're finely tuned to support life the life of the astronauts. The slightest change in these conditions makes, uh, puts the lives of the astronauts in jeopardy. In the same way, the conditions on the Earth and the universe, as we'll see, are finely tuned to support life, and the slightest change in these conditions makes life for us impossible. In fact, the scientists say that that these conditions, these finely tuned conditions, are balanced on a razor's edge. Think of it this way. Imagine two skyscrapers, and stretched across them is a tightrope. Now, literally, on either side of the tightrope, we would say they do not support life, right? You take one step to the left or one step to the right, and you plummet to your death. Well, similarly, the universe the Earth, our solar system, all of it is finely tuned. It's finely balanced for life. And if you go one way or the other, there can be no life, okay? And so on the spacecraft, it was things like oxygen level and water quantity and temperature and, and so on that makes it possible to survive. Now on Earth, it's, it's the same thing. It's the same conditions. Now listen, everybody agrees that the spacecraft was designed. Engineers, physicists, all these smart guys, they designed this spacecraft. So we attribute the fine tuning to design. For the Earth, you ask a lot of people and they will say, no, 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 it's not design. It's just chance. It just happened that way. Well, 
I'd like to show you over the next 35 minutes that, no, no, we reason back from fine-tuning of the universe to design as well. So here's our game plan. I want to start with the Earth, then I want to go to the solar system, then I want to go look at our galaxy, and then I want to go out to the structure of the entire universe. And if you're not convinced that there is an uh, omniscient, all-powerful God, uh, I don't know what would convince you. I think this is the most powerful argument that exists. And so let's start with the Earth, real local. Let's talk about first our atmosphere. Not only do we need an atmosphere, we need just the right atmosphere. In fact, Earth has just the right atmosphere primarily because it, contain, it contains oxygen. The atmosphere, uh, our atmosphere, contains 21% oxygen. You're thinking, what's so special about that? Well, if we were to take that oxygen level down to 15% from 21, everyone in this room would drop dead. We would suffocate. Okay? In fact, all large mammals would die at 15%. You crank it up to 25%, and now the oxygen richness is, is, is uh, so uh, dense that what would happen is if you lit a, a, a match, then fires could spontaneously break out. That would make life on this planet extremely improbable, quite difficult. And so 21% seems to be just right. But let's keep going because you guys are not impressed by that. Say, I'm not impressed by that. <laughs> you lie. How about this? The Goldilocks principle, how many of you have read at one point Goldilocks and the Three Bears, right? We read that to our little girls. I notice it's actually the only children's book that condones breaking and entering. <laughs> Seriously, like no one gets punished for that. And so uh, there's actually something in astronomy called the Goldilocks principle. Let me explain it to you. The Earth uh, is at just the right distance from our star, which we call the, yeah, and if it were a little bit closer or a little bit further away, well, you see the temperature is just too extreme. And so if we were to move a little bit closer to the, Earth, the sun, like where Venus is, well, Venus is too hot. Venus is actually 700 degrees Fahrenheit, a little warm, okay? I'm not going to go there to get a tan. If you go a little bit further out to Mars, while well, Mars is at its equator in the middle of summer, it's zero degrees Celsius, okay? Just at the freezing point. So you're not going to travel there for your summer vacation. Plus, it would take about 300 days to get there one way. And so uh, the Goldilocks principle not only affects temperature, but it affects something else that's really important. So we're in this life zone. And if you get a little bit too far out, it affects, it affects our liquid water. Now, where we're at, uh, where we're at as far as distance to the sun, we have all three states of water. That is liquid, solid, and gas. If you go out to Mars, all you will find is ice. All you will find is solid water, ice. Okay? And a lot of scientists get pretty excited about that because they think, well, where there's ice, there must be life. right? Where there's water, there must be life because life is just add water. Now, if you get too close, you get too close, there's another problem because all you have is water vapor. This is actually part of the problem with Venus. Venus has what's called a runaway greenhouse effect. If you've ever been in a greenhouse, it's pretty warm. Well, it's that, that atmosphere, all that water vapor, actually traps the heat, okay? And that's part of the issue with Venus. Now, I like this picture. Earth is at just the right distance so that we have water in all three states, solid, liquid, and gas. Now, there's a really puzzling uh, question about this picture, okay? In fact, let me give you another one. There's something very odd about this picture, and it is that that huge iceberg is floating. And you guys are so used to seeing something like that, you're probably thinking, what's the big deal about that? There's something really cool about water. <coughs> water is unique in that, does it get more dense or less dense when it freezes? Yeah, it gets less dense. Every other substance, if you go, you're a grade 9 uh, science class, you might learn about particle theory. They'll say, hey, when something gets colder, the particles get closer together. Huh. So it should get more dense. But because of the molecular structure of H2O, 
it actually gets less dense. And, and, and so solid water, ice, floats. This is important because if that didn't happen, all those things would actually sink to the bottom. All ice in lakes would sink to the bottom and it would just begin to layer over time. Eventually, it would freeze from the bottom up. All marine life would die. And then eventually, all of life would die. They call that a snowball earth. And so it seems like the structure of water seems to be even finely tuned for life. And if you don't believe me, you can try this at home. Take a glass, step one. Step two, fill it with water. Step three, put ice in it. If it doesn't float, you've done something wrong, okay? Yeah. All right, how about this? Not only is, uh, are we at the right distance for temperature and for all three states of water, and we have lots of water, also the size of the Earth seems to be finely tuned for life. Now, some people argue, you know, why would God make the Earth so small? I mean, if he made it a little bit bigger, we wouldn't have to worry about overpopulation, that kind of thing. You know, wouldn't that be better? Well, it turns out if you crank up the size of the Earth to twice as big, you have another problem because all of a sudden the gravitational pull is greater and you have more gravitational pull pulling in more atmosphere and you end up with something like Venus. That is a runaway greenhouse effect, okay? And so more atmosphere... Is, is not necessarily a good thing, but that happens when you get a bigger Earth. Let's say you make it smaller. Let's say if we made the Earth half as big. Well, you lose your atmosphere, and all you have is like a planet uh, that resembles something like our moon, okay, that really has no atmosphere. And so our Earth even seems to be just the right size for life. But you're still not impressed. Say, I'm not impressed. Right. You lie. Okay, so how about this? The Earth's tilt. Did you know that the Earth was tilted? You probably felt it coming in. You had to catch your balance. No, you don't actually have to catch your balance. It is tilted, though. If the Earth wasn't tilted, uh, the sun would be bombarding the uh, equator um, with so much radiation that it would be extremely hot uh, to, to live there. And so the temperature both at the equator would be too, too hot, and at the poles would actually be too cold. You know how cold the poles get already, and that's with the tilt. Now, our Earth is tilted. Do you guys know what uh, angle? 23. Nice. 23 and a half. I don't know. Who got, it? who got out their protractor and measured that one? So 23 and a half degrees, it's tilted. And this is the reason why we have our seasons. Okay? This is, the, this is what's responsible for that. And there might be a, there's a few other factors, but primarily the tilt of the Earth. And even with the tilt, you get some extremes, okay? But you could imagine what the extremes would be like if the Earth was not tilted. But you're still not impressed. So let's move on to the magnetic field. Did you guys know there's a giant bar magnet in the center of the Earth? And it's red and blue, just like that one. <laughs> no, we actually have a liquid iron core at the center of the Earth, and this creates a magnetic field. You're thinking, what's so big about a magnetic field? Why is that important? Well, if we didn't have our magnetic field, if our magnetic field didn't exist, you wouldn't either, okay? Our magnetic field protects us from dangerous com uh, cosmic radiation. This is one of the liabilities of being so close to the sun. We're in that Goldilocks zone, the life zone, but being that close has another problem, and that's the radiation. Now watch this. This was worth the price of admission. Here we go. Oh yeah, that's right. You guys all want to see that again in slow motion? Okay, here we go. It gets deflected. And so the magnetic field is like a shield, okay, that deflects most of the cosmic radiation. Some still gets through. Um, it's just good enough to get my base tan. All right, how about this? Let's move out from the Earth, and let's move to the solar system, all right, to the, so to the solar system. It turns out that not only is our Earth finely tuned, for life, but so is our solar system. Now, you're probably wondering, where'd that ninth planet go? You, did you guys hear what happened? So sad. Pluto, what happened to Pluto? Got demoted to a dwarf planet, okay? What, do you guys know why? No one knows why. Why do you think? Everybody says too small. It's not that it's too small. 
uh, Pluto, actually the orbit of Pluto crosses over Neptune's, and someone determined, thou shall have their own orbit if you want to be a planet. I don't know who gets to make that call. I want to be that guy. Uh, you can actually watch the debate. It's funny, because when I was in high school, Pluto was a planet, all right? There was nine planets, and now uh, there's eight. And so um, you can actually watch a debate. It's two hours long on YouTube on whether Pluto should be a, a planet. It's riveting. <laughs> Don't go watch it. Now here's the problem. Why are we talking about our solar system? Well, we're the third rock from the sun, and I don't know if you guys heard, but there is an asteroid heading straight for us. Everyone together now. Oh no, it's an asteroid heading straight for us. Wow, that was good. <laughs> Got some real Oscar winners in here. Now if an asteroid, a good sized asteroid hit the Earth, we would uh, probably endure an extinction event of uh, almost all of life. Uh, maybe all of life it's, if it's a good size. Fortunately for us, we have some really cool neighbors. And they're not just cool, they're humongous. And one of those neighbors is Jupiter. Uh, you guys are probably familiar with Jupiter. Jupiter, if you wanted to uh, fill Jupiter with Earths, it would take a thousand Earths to fill Jupiter. In fact, this isn't to scale, but that, that uh, red spot, that's a hurricane on Jupiter that's been lasting thousands of years, well, at least hundreds of years. And uh, it's, some people would call it a hypercane, not just a hurricane. And it is three to four times the size of Earth, that one storm, okay? So if you thought Hurricane Patricia was going to be bad, well, that thing's a lot bigger than that. Why am I telling you all this, though? It turns out Jupiter is a cosmic vacuum cleaner. In fact, you read any standard public school textbook, and it actually says as much. And so when we have asteroids like this, and they come straight towards the Earth from out of our solar system, well, we don't have to worry because Jupiter sucks them all in, co comets and, and asteroids and that. It, it protects us. It's kind of like the starting offensive line that protects the quarterback. We get protected by our gas giant friends, and in, uh, in particular, Jupiter. So literally, we should thank God for Jupiter. If Jupiter didn't exist, you wouldn't either, okay? But let's move out from there. Let's move out from the solar system to the galaxy. Do you guys know what our galaxy is called? The Milky Way. Do you know why? Because it tastes delicious. <laughs> now, that joke kills in the States because they have the Milky Way chocolate bar. We have the Mars bar, which is a close second, I guess. And so here we have our Milky Way galaxy. It's a spiral galaxy. It's huge. Uh, it's 100,000 light years across. That's pretty big. Uh, that's actually a distance measurement. Our meter stick's a little small. So I thought, how do we measure this thing? Well, let's take the amount of time it takes light to travel in one year. Well, if you take 100,000 100, of those, you have the distance of our uh, galaxy across. That would be, uh, one light year is 10 trillion kilometers, okay? So a million trillion kilometers across is our galaxy. It has probably 200 billion stars in it. At the center is, you guys know what's at the center? It's not pretty. Black hole, there's super giant stars, there's supernova, which are basically exploded stars. Well, it turns out, just like there's a life zone for Earth to exist, in distance, in proximity to the sun. We need to be a certain distance from the center of our galaxy. And here's why. You don't want to be too close to one of these supergiant stars when it goes off, right? That's bad news. And it turns out there's a lot of radiation real close to uh, the center of this, the galaxy. In fact, you don't want to be neighbors with a black hole, okay? That should almost be self-explanatory. Uh, you don't, actually don't want to live inside a spiral arm because what you're looking at is just dense clusters of stars and, and, and gas. And so you don't want to be in there either. The radiation, they, they think, would just be way too um, hostile to, for life. And so we actually live in between spiral arms, which is really interesting. The perfect spot for life. Not only that, we live a certain distance out from the center. If you get too far out in our galaxy, there's actually no 
heavy elements out there, okay? And so uh, chemistry class would be a lot of fun out there. It's like, kids, open your textbooks, get out your periodic table, okay, hydrogen, <laughs> that's it, helium. So it'd be, you know, a couple of gases and that's it out there. And so we, we probably couldn't live out there either. And so we live in this, what we might call a galactic habitable zone, okay? Not only that, we live in a group of, of galaxies. Our galaxy called the Milky Way, we live uh, next to another galaxy called the Andromeda Galaxy, two and a half million light years away, okay? So pretty, pretty uh, far away. And then there's all these dwarf galaxies in there too. This is interesting because when we survey the night sky, what we find is pockets of galaxies, but they come in the tens of thousands. And yet in ours, our little pocket, our little local group is what it's called, is about 40 galaxies. And that's important too because, again, many galaxies means many stars, which means lots of radiation. But what I want, what I want you to do right now is forget everything I just told you. And you're probably thinking, already done, <laughs> right? <laughs> already done. I want to show you what I think is really the most powerful argument from the fine-tuning of the universe, the structure of the universe. Now, uh, this is probably the, one of the most exciting arguments that's come out of the 20th and 21st centuries, okay? You could imagine that there's a room in the universe that has all these dials that controls the universe. Let's call it the universe control room, okay? And it has all these dials. And if these dials aren't set just right, the gravitational constant just set just right, well, all of a sudden, you don't, even, you don't have life. Not only do you not have life, you don't have stars or planets or galaxies, OK? You don't want to mess with the dials. You mess with the dials, there's no life. I'm going to show you uh, a couple of these dials um, and show you just how awesome this is. So remember, just clicking the dial over, one spot sends you from life permitting to life prohibiting. Okay, life prohibiting. What, where there was once a chance for life, there's now no chance of life. Now here's what some, here's what some uh, non-Christian scientists are saying about this. Here's uh, Freeman Dyson. He did not invent the vacuum cleaner, okay, in case you're wondering. He's a theoretical physicist. He says this, the more I, un the more I examine the universe and study the details of its architecture, the more evidence I find that the universe, in some sense, must have known we were coming. It's a strange thing for someone to say who's not a theist. How about this? Sir Fred Hoyle, astronomer, he says, a common sense interpretation of the facts that we're going to look at suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics. I don't know how monkeys always end up in these kind of debates. As well as with chemistry and biology. And there are no blind forces we're speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates, and we're going to calculate some numbers, from the facts seems to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion beyond question. I like this quote. This guy's got a PhD from Yale. He's an astronomer, professor. He says this, as we survey all the evidence, the thought insistently arises that some supernatural agency, or rather agency, capital A, that's his term, must be involved. Is it possible that suddenly, without intending to, we have stumbled upon scientific proof of the existence of a supreme being? The answer is yes. Was it, was it God who stepped in and so providentially crafted the cosmos for our benefit? The answer is yes. Let me show you what these men are talking about and how this evidence has actually brought many physicists who said, I was an atheist before this, to belief in God and many to belief in Christ. How about this? The gravitational constant. You guys are all familiar with the law of gravity. Keeps us on the earth. I jump up, the earth is big, has a lot of gravity, pulls me back down. Turns out, and I, I used to teach this in grade 12, that right there uh, is the force of gravity, the equation we would use. The, gra the big G is the universal uh, gravitational um, constant there. We have two m's. Those m's represent masses. Basically saying every two masses in the universe are attracted to each other. 
every two masses. I'm attracted to the podium here. It's a strong attraction, so I'm not getting pulled over. It's uh, sorry, a weak attraction. If I uh, I'm attracted to the Andromeda galaxy two and a half million light years away. In fact, I use this as a pickup line on my wife at York University. Oh yeah, and she still married me. I said, so we met, she was introduced, I was introduced to her from a common friend in the, in the library, and uh, she came over and I said, did you know that you're attracted to me? <laughs> she said, excuse me, she was studying chemistry, and excuse me. And I said, yeah, gravitationally. <laughs> and she still married me, believe it or not. The gravitational constant, the constant that's in that equation, scientists, not Christian scientists, scientists in general have argued, and this is actually a conservative number, that that constant has to be just right. It is finely tuned to one chance in 10 to the 40th power. What does that mean? Well, that's a one followed by 40 zeros, okay? One chance in that huge number. Let me give you a sense of how big that number is. The odds of being hit by lightning are about one in a million. That's the yellow number there. The odds of winning the lottery in our country, I'm rounding up here, one in a hundred million, okay? So if you don't think those odds are good, <coughs> check out the odds here. The odds of being hit by lightning twice are one in a trillion. But the odds of getting the gravitational constant just so for life to even have a chance of existing is one chance in 10 to the 40th power. Let me give you a sense of that. I didn't come up with this, but I think it's, very, it's a very creative way to illustrate. Imagine we took the entire continent of North America, not just Canada, North America, cover it in dimes. I don't know why our dime has a sailboat. When I go to the States, I'm like, why is there a sailboat on there? I need to watch those heritage moments that they have the commercials for. And then you so cover the entire economy of North American dimes and then stack it up to the moon. Say, that's a lot of dimes. That's a lot of dimes. That is a lot of dimes, but that's not near as many as we're going to consider here. Because I want you to do that a billion more times. Okay? That's a lot of dimes. Whole continent to the moon, do it a billion more times. And then I take my friend Justin, sorry Justin, I put a gun to his head, I blindfold him, and I paint one dime red, and I throw it into the pile. And I say, pick the red one or you're dead. Those are the chances. The one in 10 to the 40th power. If he did it, what would we say? Wow. We would probably say, Justin, you peaked. <laughs> you designed the outcome, and then have to pull the trigger. No, I would never do that. Now, that is just one of many dials that needs to be set. But what I want to show you now is the mother of all fine-tuning. Okay? It's a number that is going to make your head hurt. Okay? So, scientists, many scientists believe that the universe began as a tiny ball of energy 13.7 billion years ago. Whether you agree with that or not, this argument is good, okay? Because your atheist friend doesn't think the Earth is 6,000 years old, okay? Your atheist friend thinks that this is true. So this is the argument you use with them. So all the entire universe started, remember, it went from nothing to this ball of energy, and then that expanded over time until you have a universe today, kind of like this. I started out as a single cell, a zygote, in my mother's womb. And, and then over time, I developed more cells and so on. But that single cell wasn't just a blob of whatever. That cell was specified. It had all this, uh, we might call specified complexity. It was such a way that it could produce me 32 years later, okay? In the same way, that ball of energy wasn't just some random ball of energy. It turns out what they call the initial mass energy distribution had to be so finely tuned. Well, let's just see how finely tuned it is to produce life. Oxford, Oxford mathematical physicist Roger Penrose, he said, if you want life, 
That initial mass energy distribution had to be finely tuned to one chance in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd power. That's a hyper exponential. It makes you throw up in your mouth. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. You will never see a number that big. In fact, if you read his book, he's not a Christian. You read his, you read his book, he'll tell you. Even if you had a universe-sized piece of paper, you couldn't write down that number. In fact, if you wrote a zero on every atom in the universe, you couldn't write down all the zeros. I would love to show you all the zeros in that number, but I can't. So here's my illustration. And I had a PhD friend uh, in mathematics from uh, Laurier University help me with this, because I needed someone smart. Take the entire, imagine we take all the atoms in the universe, all of them, protons, neutrons, electrons, and we put them in a jar, paint them all blue. And then you have one green one. That would be one chance in 10 to the 80th power. That seems like a big number. If you were to pull out that green atom, that green electron, you'd think, man, that guy's pretty lucky, right? That guy, that couldn't happen by chance. It turns out, though, to get our number, to get our number 10 to the 10 to the 123rd power, you know how many times you have to do that in a row? I blindfold Justin put a gun to his head, he picks it the first time. And I say, whoa, that was good. You gotta do it again, though. Not only do you have to do it again, but you gotta do it another time, and another time. In fact, you have to do it more times in a row than there are atoms in the universe to get the number that we just looked at. If he did it twice in a row, I'd be saying, Justin, you're peaking. If he did it 100 times in a row, I'd say, Justin, you are cheating. You're designing this thing. This points to design. That is why guys like Roger, uh, Robert Jastro, this guy's not a Christian either. He's an agnostic. He wrote a book called God and the Astronomers because he saw all this evidence. And he said, for the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak. And as he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. <laughs> the scientists are just getting caught up to speed with what theologians have been saying for centuries. What have they been saying for centuries? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. They've been saying that for centuries. And it's just our 20th century uh, and 21st century science that is, is confirming this over and over and over again. Now, here's the problem. How does an atheist respond to this? What is the best argument that they will offer in response to what I just presented to you? Here it is. It's called the multiverse. It's called the multiverse. What they say is, they believe that if there's an infinite number of, uni not galaxies, universes out there, then surely one of those universes is going to be finely tuned for life. So there's an infinite number of universes out there, most of which do not have life. But our universe, with all of its galaxies and all of its stars, our universe is just the lucky one, okay? Well, what's the problem with this kind of argument? Well, first of all, this is not a scientific argument. If you hear a scientist start talking about the multiverse, they've checked out of their scientific discipline, and I think reality. And so this is, not, this is not physics anymore, it's metaphysics. In fact, there's no real experiment you can do in our universe to detect another universe. We're trapped in our own universe. And so if we could detect one, well, that would be still a part of ours, okay? So that's one of the first problems. Another problem, though, a lot of philosophers have come to uh, realize is that even this universe, to get all these universes, they must come from somewhere, and they think, well, there must be some kind of device or something out there. I'm just going to call it a universe generator that must be producing all of these universes. I mean, where else would they be coming from? Well, it turns out they think that even this universe generator must be finely tuned. And so it's kind of like this. Have you ever had a bump in the rug before? A bump in a rug? And you think, oh, no problem. Oh, that fine-tuning, that fine-tuning universe? I'll just squish that down right here. No problem. <laughs> the problem is, you end up with a finely tuned universe. You push the problem back. You still haven't escaped the fine-tuning. Even the universe, uh, this multiverse, 
uh, seems to be finely tuned. If there is such a thing, it requires some kind of tuning. Now, here's the thing. There's something in philosophy that we call Occam's razor. And it basically says that you don't, if you have a simple explanation, you just go with it. You don't try and multiply your explanations when you don't need to. Well, you tell me what's simpler. An infinite number of universes that are undetectable and unobservable, or one God? What seems more simple? What seems more adequate? In fact, we have other arguments that point to God, don't we? From the origin of the universe and others. And so it turns out, Occam's razor says, we just cut, we cut, we get rid of, oh no. I just cut right to my desktop. No, I did that on purpose. That's pretty cool though, right? <laughs> Anyways, this is what happens when you're working on this stuff at like two in the morning. So folks, the fine tuning implies a designer of life. And 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul, near the beginning of his letter to the Romans, he said this, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal nature and divine, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse, okay? So this design, it's everywhere. You don't need to have a PhD uh, to understand all of this. In fact, David just looked up at the stars and he saw it, okay? He just looked up at the stars and he saw it. In fact, he said, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. A, a, a few centuries later, Isaiah posed a question. Of course, this is God speaking through Isaiah. And God says, to whom will you compare me or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift your eyes, look to the heavens. Who created all these? Who brings out their starry hosts one by one and calls them each by their name? God compares himself with the heavens because the heavens are absolutely awesome. Now what you're looking at is what's called the Hubble Deep Field. There's actually a space telescope and they, it's, the, it's the Hubble telescope and it's taking pictures of the night sky. They actually found a piece of the night sky that they thought was empty. It was just black. They thought it was empty. So they focused their telescope on it for something like, what well, was hours. I think if I recall correctly, it was like 11 days or something. And then the images that came back, it was this. A part of the night sky we thought was empty contained 10,000 galaxies. That's awesome, right? So what you're looking at is mostly galaxies, except for here, that's a star, and here's a star. These are all galaxies, there's a spiral galaxy. The heavens are awesome. Just how big are they? If you were to hop in our best equipment, a space shuttle, which travels at eight kilometers a second or five miles a second, and you wanna go from our star, our sun, to the nearest star, the nearest star, it would take you 200,000 years. 200,000 years. And we think we're going to explore space. And so you have all of these galaxies that are just incredible. Um, but what's really cool, I really like this guy. This is called a globular cluster. Say globular. It's just a great word. It's a globular cluster. Uh, it's just a cluster of stars. Thousands of stars. Now the reason I bring this up is if you were a planet inside that globular cluster, you would have no idea that there was a universe out there like ours. Think about this. If you go into the city, is Kingston a city? <coughs> if you go into Toronto downtown and you look up at the night sky, you're not going to see any stars, even at midnight. There's just too much light pollution, right? You've got to go up to the country where there's not a lot of light. Imagine you are in this globular cluster and you were just surrounded by stars. It's just light all the time. You would never know there's other galaxies out there. So not only is our universe finely tuned for our existence, just to live, I think God has also finely tuned it for our ability to observe the heavens, to study his creation. That's no accident. I want to show you a clip. You might recognize this guy. Do you guys recognize him? Who is it? Oh, is it on the screen? Bill Nye the Science Guy. And I'm, I mean, I'm guilty of showing videos of his. Some of his stuff, some of his show is actually pretty creative. Kids enjoy laughing at some of the stuff he, he talks about in his videos. But he's got, he's, he definitely has uh, a philosophy that he's committed to, and that is naturalism. He's an atheist. 
and he's speaking at the American uh, Humanist Association Conference. I want you to listen to what he says here. So I remember thinking, I am just another speck of sand. And the earth, really, in the cosmic scheme of things, is another speck. And the sun, an unremarkable star, nothing special about the sun. The sun is another speck. And the galaxy is a speck. I'm a speck on a speck, orbiting a speck, among other specks, among still other specks, in the middle of specklessness. <laughs> I am not, I am insane, I suck. <laughs> so when he looks at the heavens, when he looks at the heavens, he sees how insignificant he is. He calls himself just a speck, right? That's his conclusion. I mean, that's all he really can conclude as an atheist. But that's the wrong perspective. When we look at the heavens, we don't have that perspective. We have more of a God perspective. We look at the size of the universe and we say with David that the heavens declare the glory of God. He's comparing himself with the heavens. I mean, what else could he compare himself with? And not only that, and I like this, when I was at Saddleback last week, I was giving this talk to some, some high schoolers and some girls came up afterwards and they said, we're not just a speck, we're spectacular. <laughs> and I thought, hey, that's not bad. I'm going to put that in my talk and I'll give you credit for it. Because David said, the heavens declare the glory of God, but he also said this, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? And that's a very profound question. But the answer is, he really does care for us. Everything we've looked at, every finely tuned condition is put in place for your and I survival, for our survival. Not only that, David says, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who revere him. This is really interesting because we just looked at how, how big the heavens were. He compares his love to us by this. So don't just think of as high as the heavens, like those clouds are pretty high. No, no, no. Think of the Hubble deep field. As high as the heavens, he's saying his love for us is just infinite. I mean, as far as we're concerned, the universe is huge. And so in a way, in a way, we've been talking about God's love for us this entire time. Every fine-tuned condition uh, we've looked at, and there are many, 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 many more was put in place for your benefit and for my benefit because God loves us that much. And not only does he love us that much, but he loves us, you guys know, enough to send his son. So we're not just, so you do a talk like this, you talk about the fine-tuned conditions, and it looks like, man, we're kind of like God's ant farm. We're like his hamsters. No, 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 it's not like that. He's not just some distant deity who created this world and this finely tuned and left it. No, he actually became a part of it took on flesh. He loved us so much to become uh, a part of it and die for us. That's really cool. I mean, I think that's actually more awesome than everything we've looked at.